Hello, so today I'm going to be looking at Conformity Asher's research and he conducted this in 1956. The picture below is just his study, uh, the setup whereby you had your standard line, which is the X, and then that matches to one of the comparison lines. In this case, the correct one would be B. And as always, I am following along with the AQA psychology textbook, the one with the green hair girl on it. So I've just put together my normal slide of things you need to know and be able to recognise for the exam. So I've just put a specification point up and it's essential that you know variables affecting conformity, including group size, unanimity and task difficulty, as investigated by Ash. Something that you also need to know is that ASH is related to conformity. Sometimes people get these muddled up, thinking that ASH is potentially obedience, or they get it wrong with Milgram, thinking he's conformity. ASH is conformity, and so is Zimbardo, whereas Milgram is obedience. And also, ASH became before Zimbardo and Milgram, and it's kind of a good idea to have a gauge of the dates. So ASH is 1956. If you struggle to remember dates, I always try and think of an event that happened in that year. And if you know one, then you can, in your head, think, OK, what date, what event is the same as a study and in this case Ash is 1956 and my dad was born in 1956 so that's how I always remember that. Okay so Ash's aim, I think it's important to look at this because sometimes we can forget almost the direction of the research so I've just also added a picture in sometimes that helps people to remember what study they did. Okay so Ash's aim was to see whether people would go with what they know is right or give in to the pressure of the majority and go along with its decision. So Ash's procedure, you could actually be asked a six mark question of AO1, so that's your description, on just his procedure. So I've put this down into key bullet points of what I think would be included in an answer, what you should include. So he used 123 American undergraduates and these were all volunteers. He told them that they were taking part in a vision test, so that's also you can critique that point of, oh, it's deception. They weren't taking part in a vision test. We know that it was to see whether they would conform to a majority group. They were shown three lines of different lengths, as shown in that picture on the right hand side, and asked which met the standard line, which is that X line. Participants all sat around a table. And the real participant was always seated last or next to last. And all the other people around the table were confederates. And when we say confederates, we mean people acting, very staged like. It was always done in the same order. So they always asked the first person, the second person, the third person in the table in order. So that that real participant was always last or next to last. And the Confederates were all given instructions to give the same incorrect answer on 12 out of the 18 trials. And these 12 were known as critical trials because it was when they gave the incorrect ones. And when we say trial, we mean one occasion when they identified the length of the line. So I've just created this picture to symbolise the setup of the procedure so it hopefully gives you a visual idea that the real participants sat where number six is or seven so they would never be first second third fourth or fifth there had to be five of us go before them they would all say what line they would want to pick and then six and seven was the real participant so the findings you could be asked this as a question on its own so you need to make sure you know this on the 12 critical trials, 36.8% of the responses made by the real participants were incorrect. So 36.8% of times the real participant answered incorrectly. 75% of the participants conformed at least once and then 25% just never conformed. And a term that's used in the textbook is the ash effect. So what we mean by this is the extent to which participants conform, even when the situation is unambiguous. So even when we haven't done anything to manipulate the situation, 
as Ash did in his variations, even when that doesn't happen, people still conform. And then, so why did they conform? Ash interviewed his participants saying, why did you go along with it? Even though we could blatantly tell it wasn't the right answer. And they all said, or a lot of them said, it was to avoid rejection. And that is the normative social influence. So if you remember, normative social influence is the need to be liked, wanting to be liked by a group. And so their main reason for conforming was to avoid the rejection of that group. And now we have Asher's variations. So there was three of these and the first one is group size. So what Ash found was that you need at least three confederates in order for conformity to rise. So with three confederates and the real participant, conformity rises to 31.8%. But if you add more confederates, that percentage increase doesn't really go up by that much and it makes very little difference. So you need a majority of three, but if you keep adding, it doesn't go up by that much. So the use of six others on his original 36.8% it's not too much difference as 31. So it's that you need a majority of three. That was the key number. So really do try and remember it's three for group size. Task difficulty. Now this was made much more difficult by ensuring that the lines were more or less the same size. They were the same length. And so conformity increased there because of this need for informational social influence, which if you remember, it's where you look to others for the right answer because you want to be right, so you look to see what others are doing, and therefore conformity increased in that case. And then finally, you have this unanimity, which I've put a definition in there because it can be a little confusing, I find, with this one. So it's when all the Confederates agree by all giving the same wrong answer in the following examples, which I've done on the next slide except one of the confederates gives either the correct or the other wrong answer and what that does is that it enables the real participant to think how they want to think so it enables them to then go on and say the right answer so if you look here i've got the group saying number three i've got a confederate saying number one and then the real participant will say number one because that confederate says number one, which is different to the group, it enables the real participant to then say one, because somebody else is disagreeing with the group, and therefore it enables them to say what they truly think. Therefore, conformity drops from 32% to 5.5%. Similarly, when we look at the bottom example, if you've got the group and they are all saying three, the confederate says two, which is also the wrong answer, it still enables the real participant to say one because the confederate is just saying something different to the group. And in that instance, conformity drops from 32% to 9%. And these are all statistics from Ash. Now, you know, we've got the evaluation and it's very important because it can go anywhere with this. It could just be an evaluation question on its own that you are asked about. So a first criticism of Ash is that it is a child of its time. And this is shown by Perrin and Spencer in 1980. So remember, Ash did his studies in 1956 and Perrin and Spencer come along a bit later with engineering students. And what they find is that only one student conforms out of a total of 396 trials. And then we could ask, well, engineering students, maybe they are a bit more confident in their judgment of the lines. But when we look at America in the time when the study was conducted, it was very conformist time so people would follow along with what others were saying just because that was the social norms of the time so it's what we would expect that is in the 1950s and so actually because when we come to the 1980s that doesn't happen maybe the ash effect is not consistent across time and therefore it lacks this thing called temporal validity so when you apply it to a different time you don't get the same result 
And as always, I've just written this up in a sort of P paragraph and linked it back to the question that you would have, linked it back to what I'm trying to support and say so that it follows through. So I'll just read you this. A limitation of Asser's research is that it may be a child of its time. For example, Perrin and Spencer, 1980, found that only one engineering student conformed in a total of 396 trials. It may be that they were more confident, but the 1950s were a highly conformist time. Therefore, Asher's study suggests that participants were just following social norms at the time. As this study does not support the conformity shown in Asher's study, it suggests that the Asher effect may not be consistent across time and it hence lacks temporal validity, a limitation of Asher's research. Another limitation that we have is an artificial situation in task. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to have noticed that when we were going through the procedure. If you're getting people to just look at lines and say whether they match, it is very artificial. It's not something that you would have to do in everyday life. Fizz comes along and says, well, the groups were not very groupy. What we find is that the groups, well, they're all strangers in theory. They're not very, as in how your friendship groups would be. They all know each other. They didn't really know each other because the real participant just joins a group of confederates. That real participant doesn't know anybody in that circle. So really, we cannot generalise. And it has this thing called mundane realism, low mundane and low ecological validity. So they're the same things. You cannot apply it to everyday life because it's just not something that you would normally see. And also we may have demand characteristics where they're doing, the participants are doing what they think they should do to please the experimenter in that case and all, these are limitation points and that can all form as one sort of evaluation point we also have a limited application of findings only men were tested and actually women might be more conformist than men that was found by netto in 1995 could also say that the USA is a very individualistic culture so even though we saw people conforming maybe the the conforming was actually quite low as opposed to other cultures then we look at collectivist cultures such as china so this is where they care about the group they're all for the group whereas usa it's very individualistic very you go off and you do what you want uh, so there'll be higher conformity and there, this was actually found in china because they do value the group so it's not very a, a surprising result necessarily and so therefore conformity can actually be higher than what Ash found in other cultures. A further limitation is that findings only apply to certain situations. So we do have a flaw here in the procedure, which I'll flag up. So participants may want to have impressed the group of strangers. So they're in a circle with all these strangers and they might just want to impress the people around them. But what Williams and Sogan found in 1894 was that conformity was higher when the groups were friends. So if you had a group of friends, you're more likely to conform than what you are if you're around strangers. If you're around strangers, you're most likely not ever actually going to see them again. And therefore, the procedure may have actually influenced the level of conformity. By putting together strangers, that may mean that there is less conformity found. And this is a confounding variable which isn't controlled for. So the problem that we have is that from the results that we have from ASH, we may actually draw unjustified conclusions about how common or how unusual conforming behaviour is. So therefore, actually, ASH's findings may not be as valid as we once thought. Furthermore, we have ethical issues. So deception is the key one here. Real participant they thought the other people involved were actually genuine participants and not confederates. They may have guessed they were acting potentially, but they weren't told any difference. So they would have had to have assumed that the people around them were in the exact same position to them. Uh, but we can actually say that this ethical cost could be weighed up against the benefits of the study. So I have got a few positives and it is hard really to find any sort of positives for ASH. But if you did want to, these can be included. So actually the knowledge we've gained is a benefit. 
to society, to people, potentially, because we are showing how destructive that social influence is. And also psychological harm that the participants experienced, it wasn't really that bad. It wasn't like we tortured them. It was just a bit of a mild maybe embarrassment if they said the wrong answer. And it was all dealt with through debriefing. Okay, so I'll just go through uh, an AS exam paper question. This is June 2016, and this was on the AS exam, not the A level. So this is the question outline Asher's findings in relation to two variables affecting conformity, briefly explain two limitations of Asher's conformity research. And I would really urge you to just have a go at this and try and plan it first if you're unsure. In think about the findings in relation to two variables. I have just covered those and two limitations, which means if you'd give a strength, you wouldn't be getting the marks. It has to be limitations. And what I've also done is just added this mark scheme on. These are the brackets, the levels that uh, justify your marks as to what level you fall in. Even for level four, something that I picked out was this, that the uh, minor detail and or expansion is sometimes lacking. So you can still get full marks, even if it is lacking in areas. So it is really important to have a look at what the mark scheme is looking for and something that I've just flagged out as well is the marks for this question this is AO1 and AO3 and it sometimes students get confused over this because they're not sure oh what how much should I talk for the first part of the question and the second part and it is important when they do this that you do answer both parts of the question sometimes students can get too carried away at the start or just focus on the last bit and here we've got AO1 for full marks, so that's your description, and AO3 for full marks, and that's your evaluation. It's saying two of each, so you're looking at a 2-2 two, two, and another 2-2. Two, two. One point for AO3, another point. And with this AO3, you don't need to expand that far on your evaluation, but it's only worth two marks a time. But it is still worth practising putting your evaluation into peel paragraphs. And here is the mark scheme. So it gives you content that it recommends you include in your answer. And it is very interesting to have a look at what they put. See, they've put used the gender bias. Asher's task was artificial for these limitations. A volunteer sample. Yep, remember we did mention that. So it might not represent that of a wider population. And ethical problems, including deception. And it also mentions protection from harm. Something that is also important to look at is credit other relevant limitations. Sometimes students think, oh, I've got to have exactly what's on this mark scheme. But we talked about other things than just the artificial task and gender bias. We included more than that. And they would have been credited as well. OK, thank you for listening. And I'd just like to say good luck with the rest of your revision.